Okay, good. Shall we commence? <clears throat> okay, I um, have left quite a few things uh, for you to work on. The last lecture, <coughs> towards the end, I asked to work out a change in internal energy with volume at constant temperature for a Van der Waals gas. And um, essentially, uh, the topic last time was um, integrating the differential forms and getting these quantities from some initial values and um, finding the quantities. All right, that was good. Let's move on to a new topic. I would like to discuss today, I think this will be done in today's lecture, um, on cooling techniques. How can we get to lower temperatures? Um, <clears throat> we have already read a bit about refrigeration cycle, and you will look at it in a little more detail today. But what I have in mind is uh, looking at two techniques, two phenomena which give rise to lowering of temperatures. One is the um, free expansion. And this is supposed, this is what is called Joule's experiment. And obviously this was a huge uh, excitement at the time when Joule described it. Uh, this experiment is about uh, changing volume and looking at change in temperature when you keep the internal energy constant. This is um, what was a part of the experiment that Joule performed. And this is, one can work it out quickly, how this can lead, this would lead to lowering of temperatures. Look at, uh, let us look at this uh, um, derivative over here dt by now, by now you are quite familiar with this exercise. When you have something like this, let me come look for here. When you have something like this, you know how to go about it. For any energy function being kept constant, you use the cyclic uh, property of the differentials, partial differentials, and from it use the relationship, this is minus partial differential of u with respect to v at constant t divided by partial differential of u. My u's are not consistently capital U or small u. Okay? So um, I will make this mistake quite frequently, so this is u and v, okay? du by d, t at constant v. And one can calculate the lower and upper differentials separately. By using the relationship, the famous relationship du equal to t d s minus p d v, 
so that when we have this quantity, to calculate this quantity, of course, you are quite, um, now this, this is all very familiar to you. We will divide it by dV and and then we will keep, take T constant and therefore this will become equal to um, T times partial differential of S with respect to V at constant T minus P which we can write from uh, Maxwell equivalent relations as dP by dT at constant volume minus P. <coughs> All right. Similarly, I'm doing this again and again because for those of you who feel a little, still a little afraid of these derivatives, let us do them again and again so that you know that these are not really quite as monstrous as you think. In the lower one, du by dt at constant v, by the same exercise that we did over there, divide by dt and take um, v constant will be simply equal to cv. By definition, ds by dt, t times ds by dt at constant v is cv. And the last term is zero because the volume being kept constant. And therefore, now we can go back to the one at the top, partial differential of t with respect to v at constant u happens to be minus, in the numerator, we have t times partial differential of t with respect to t at constant v minus p and in the denominator we have cv. All right, this is what this is what we have and we can also we also know that partial differential of p we have worked it this out several times at constant v happens to be alpha p over kappa t ratio of these two response functions. So we can put all of that in and therefore have this as T alpha P over kappa T minus P divided by CV is the expression. Good. And we immediately see that in the case of an ideal gas, Alpha P is equal to 1 over P, 1 over P, yeah. And kappa T is equal to 1 over T. I think we did work it out once, right? We know this. So that this whole thing is equal to zero. For ideal gas, this is equal to zero. But for a non-ideal gas, it will be, it will have some value. The last point I had left you to work on in the last lecture was about, yes? Uh, ah, ah. Did I make this mistake? Oh, yeah. Oh, you are right. You are right. If this, if I take it this way. Okay. We can, work it, we can quickly check this. He just pointed out that I can't have this okay, giving, you, giving me zero if I have a relationship like this. And he's suggesting that in fact this should be T times kappa T over alpha P. 
And why don't we quickly check it? dP by dT at constant volume is minus dV by dT at constant pressure divided by dV by dP at constant temperature. And this actually happens to be alpha P over KT. Huh? So mm, I think what I did wrong was that for I, I, I put these things wrong actually. Uh, alpha P is 1 over V dV by dT at constant P for an ideal gas P times V is nKT K, this K is Boltzmann constant and uh, dV by dT happens to be at constant P will be n times k over p right and uh, this will be equal to t times v t v over, v over t v over t uh, okay so um, towards the end of the last lecture I had asked you to show that um, for a vulnerable gas, for a vulnerable gas, du by dv at constant temperature was equal to a over uh, v squared. This v small v is capital V over capital N or small n molar volume. I asked you to work this out and of course this was an easy thing to do or you must have done it already. Um, du by dv. Right. So for uh, Wonder Wall's gas we will have uh, dt equal to dt by dv at constant u, which is what I'm, uh, oh, I need to, uh, uh, I'm going back over here. I have uh, du by, dt by dv at constant u happens to be a ratio of these two quantities, and I have only written down the numerator. The denominator is simply heat capacity. So what I have is that this dt by dV at constant U times dV, this quantity will be equal to minus times du by dV at constant T, which is A over V squared, and uh, denominator is CV. And here the interesting thing is that uh, when, because A is positive, V squared is positive, CV is positive, CV is supposed to be, response functions are all supposed to be positive quantities, so that is positive. And therefore, this quantity is positive and therefore this whole quantity is uh, over here is negative. The quantity in the bracket is negative. Which means that when dV is positive, dT is negative. All right? And dV positive means expansion. dV positive means V final minus V initial. dV is this. And positive means V final is greater than V initial, which means expansion. 
So this is expansion. And the, okay. So we are concluding that dv um, dt uh, when dv is positive, dt is negative. Because all these quantities are positive, and because of this negative sign, this is negative. Sorry? Lock and negative. 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 Lock and ये आ ये तो आप लोगों में छोड़ा था कि आप करके आएंगे भाई भेद खुल गया सारा हां भांडा फूट गया फिर ओह काम तो किया ही नहीं ओके अच्छा ओके तो ये करना चाहिए मुझे हैं मगर क्या छोड़ दूँ मैं अभी भी तो कर लेंगी कि जब मैं करके तुम यहाँ पे क्लास में अच्छा मैंने पिछली मर्तबा जब कुछ कर रहा था ना तो इतना रिपीटेटिव हो गया था मैंने सोचा कि अब मैं आप लोगों पे छोड़ दूँ कि आप लोग कर लेंगे तो भूल गए आप लोग हैं ओके ये ये चीज आप लोग जब करने बैठेंगे तो आसानी हो जाए आसानी से हो जाएगा अगर ना हुआ तो कम बैक एंड आई विल हेल्प यू डू दिस ओके इसमें सिर्फ यही नहीं था बल्कि मैंने एक और काम भी आप लोगों से कहा था लेट मी इंक्रीज योर बर्डन नाउ एक और भी मैंने कहा था कि फिर आप इसको इंटीग्रेट करेंगे और इंटीग्रेट करके आप लोग ये बताएंगे कि u एज ए फंक्शन ऑफ t एंड v इज एक्चुअली cv t टाइम्स cv माइनस a ओवर v प्लस कांस्टेंट मैंने कहा था कि इंटीग्रेट करके आप ये लोग ये भी वर्कआउट कर लीजिएगा और अगर हमने कहा कि हां ये ठीक है तो फिर du by जब वहां से अगर आप देखें तो du by dv at constant t यहां से आसानी से मिल जाएगा कि वॉल्यूम डिपेंडेंस सिर्फ यहीं पे है और जब इसको डिफरेंशिएट करेंगे तो इट विल बी प्लस a ओवर v स्क्वायर और प्लस a ओवर v स्क्वायर ही है जो यहां पे ये आ जाता है ऑलराइट तो यू कैन फाइंड इट सेपरेटली एंड यू कैन आल्सो फाइंड इट आउट फ्रॉम द इंटीग्रेटेड फॉर्म और 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 किसने कहा था कि मुझे कुछ और एक्सप्लेन करें आफ्टर दिस ही इज आस्क मी टू एक्सप्लेन दिस टू बट दिस इज द वन दैट आई जस्ट कॉपीड फ्रॉम देयर ओके एंड फॉर दिस आई एम यूजिंग व्हाट डीटी बाय डीटी एज आई सेड दिस दिस डेरिवेटिव इज द रेशियो ऑफ दोस टू डेरिवेटिव्स विद अ माइनस साइन and i only substituted their values the top derivative is this which is a over v squared with the minus sign coming out as the minus sign over there and the bottom derivative du by dt at constant v is cv all right so this is what the expression is and then my argument was that a is known to be a positive constant v squared is was a square is a positive quantity response functions are all supposed to be positive quantities therefore this whole thing is positive and because of negative sign this whole thing is negative and therefore dv positive means dt is negative dv positive is vf minus vi being positive and dt negative means dti minus t tf minus ti is negative here it means vf is larger than vi and here it means tf is smaller than ti here it means 
expansion and here it means cooling okay so at your back this expansion free expansion causes cooling all right so the free expansion that we said joule's experiment it causes cooling we just showed okay I'm sorry? Okay, uh, this actually is, uh, okay, your question actually should be that if suppose it is a free expansion, a gas coming out of a container under conditions given by those uh, is supposed to be a, 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 a process in which it causes uh, internal energy not to change. So it is expansion, but and it is kind kind of free expansion, slow expansion. And it is a, it is it is reversible slow expansion, in which the internal energy doesn't change, and therefore the process ends up. If you look at it mathematically, it shows you that that expansion causes cooling. So this was what Jules said, and then we will go a step a step further, and we will look at what. Jules Thomson said, the Jules Thomson effect, which is a very famous um, experiment, um, but we will come to that in a minute. Before that, I will complete this discussion over here, and um, I will say that, therefore, um, uh, dt. Uh, is equal to, as I have said, dt is equal to all of this, and um, I will say dt integrated from ti to tf, um, which is what we I wrote up there as tf minus ti. Here, dt is tf minus ti is equal to um, minus. A over CV times integral over volume, but this is integral over 1 over V squared, okay, V squared dV when you integrate it from volume VI to VF. Okay. And this will be equal to, on the right hand side, A over CV. This is um, integral of 1 over V squared dV is minus 1 over V. So because differential of minus 1 over V is equal to 1 over V squared. So this is equal to A over CV times 1 over V I V F minus 1 over V I. And as I just said, this gives rise to cooling because Vf is larger than Vi, and therefore Tf is smaller than Ti. I'm sorry? So 1 over Vi minus 1 over Vf, you have a minus sign. Negative cancelled. No, negative has been cancelled because um, integral of 1 over V squared dV is minus 1 over V. Okay? This code of differentiate karenge up minus 1 over v ko, so you will get plus 1 over v squared. Okay? Alright? Alright? Any problem over there? Okay. This may ye ke jabap if you want to visualize it graphically. <clears throat> temperature and volume depend upon each other in such a manner that when volume increases temperature decreases so the dependence is something like this and this dependence will depend upon the 
uh, value of internal energy. So this will be for say u1, this will be for u2, this will be for u3, uh, u1 being less than u2 being less than u3. And therefore, by expansion, you will get cooling. This is how you can express. In fact, you can also express variation of U with the volume U would increase with volume as uh, you will see for uh, various it will be for different values. I, I let, me, let, me, let me just avoid making more of these assertions because they are not quite helpful. Okay. The next cooling mecha mechanism. Okay, what is, um, how good is this cooling mechanism that we call dual expansion? Um, it would be a good cooling mechanism in principle, but in practice, the heat capacity of the container in which you keep the gas um, would take up so much of heat that you may not be able to get much cooling. And therefore, or that would also con that will contribute to the um, heat, of, heat of the gas or liquid, and therefore this may not be actually um, a very good uh, way of cooling. The other one is a little better. Uh, Jules Thompson. Effect. This is also called Jules Thompson experiment, also called porous plug experiment. And it is very successful because it leads to a very efficient cooling. Currently, uh, this is taken to be the way of uh, liquefaction, liquefying gases. And it is called a porous plug experiment because it actually is, uh, what is also called actually, another name for it is throttling. Um, experiment. Did I say experimentation? Oof. Throttling. Throttling is, uh, throttling means uh, uh, letting some liquid or gas pass through, um, uh, passing gas or liquid through pushing, not passing, in fact, pushing through uh, uh, small pores. So if you let the thing pass through small pores, say for example, we porous material of some kind and you let the gas pass through those pores, um, that will be what is, that will be called throttling. And throttling is also used in uh, mechanical engineering in engines. When you push your fuel through uh, into the uh, engine and um, when you push your f the fuel through engine, you actually make it pass through a very small nozzle. And because you, again, do the same thing, you know, okay, let it through, pass through a small port. Um, 
So that is what you do over here too. Let me now impress you with my drawing. You have actually a porous material. Okay. And um, first of all, you have a container which is uh, insulated. And in this container, you have uh, a piston on this side. And another piston on this side. So the gas over here is at temperature at pressure P1 occupies volume V1 is at temperature T1. And the pressure on this side, which is actually completely closed at the moment you have uh, on this side you have a pressure P2 which is less than P1 and because the pressure P2 is less than P1 the gas will pass through this pressure differentials will cause gas to flow so the gas will be pushed through this porous material and uh, then over here on this side the volume is v, volume is initially v2 initial is zero and at t2 we do not know t2 initial whatever and then the gas because of this pressure differential the gas will be pushed through this you will maintain Uh, the pressures, the pressures, the two sides. You will not let the pressures become equal. You will simply, it will continue so that the gas continues to flow through this. And that what happens finally is what I'm going to try and uh, describe again over here that you have this uh, insulating walls between these insulating walls you have this uh, uh, porous plug and in this porous plug now the left gas has all now being pushed into the right hand side and the right hand side has now the piston has been pushed out and the gas over here is remains at pressure P1 uh, P2 oh okay P2 yeah this is on this side P2 and occupies now volume V2 which we did not know initially it was zero and is now at temperature T2. So this is the polar porous plug experiment. You go from this situation to this situation. Okay? What happens in this case? So we start to look into, we try and see um, the consequences of doing this experiment. Let's look at change in um, internal energy which will be um, <clears throat> um, you can uf minus ui and um, this will be like actually having uh, delta q plus delta w being integrated from an initial state to a final state du is delta q plus delta w. So doing as if this is uh, this is what it what is happening and because it is completely insulated these thick walls 
up and below. No heat is being transferred. Delta Q is equal to zero. So all of this is actually initial to final of delta W. And we need to calculate this. Delta W um, initial I'm now saying what this will be equal to I'm calling it now delta W initial minus delta W final. I could put it in the bracket to say that delta W is what the work is done. Um, the work is done in the initial situation and the work that is done in the final situation. Work of course is minus P times um, minus P times dV. Okay? It is taking place at constant pressure. And therefore delta W. Work done on the system and work done by the system. An initial situation is when there is some gas or there is gas on this side, final situation when there is no gas on this side. No, this is actually two. They are being acted. One is the gas that is, uh, this gas is being pushed and the other gas is this gas is now being working on this piston to push it onto that side. No, they may not be equal. You will see now that they will, this, is, this will not be equal. And that is what actually matters. This, this is the central point. <coughs> I'm sorry? Should it be DWF minus DWI? Oh, you are saying it should be DWF minus DWI. You are perfectly right. Yes, okay, good. No, but this is the point that uh, your friend over there was raising. He was saying that W is not something which depends upon the state of the system, which doesn't specify the state of the system. And therefore it is a sort of imperfect differential as you call it. And therefore you can't ascribe some work to initial and to final. What you're saying is that there is this uh, work being done by this gas and the work done by the gas on this piston. Okay? So this is the DW uh, initial, which is minus PDV, and this is when volume changes from V1 to 0. Correct? And at that point, the pressure is P1. So DWI initial is just that. Pressure P1 changes volume from V1 to 0 and the negative sign that always accompanies this thing. And DW uh, and delta W2 WF is equal to minus uh, the initial volume was 0, the final is V2 and uh, pressure is P2 and D. Okay? So the first one happens to be, uh, this is the lower limit, upper and minus lower, it's going to be P1 times V1, and this one is going to be um, minus P2 V2. They differ in terms of the signs that come with them. Uh, so are we considering that all of the gas is being uh, pushed through the pole? So then how can P1 and P2 be different? Oh, they can, it can be, yes, why not? Because we are saying that we maintain different pressures, as I said, maintain the pressures P1 and P2. Okay? Normally, if you have two boxes at two different pressures and allow the gas to come from one to the other, then uh, they will, the gas will pass in order to equalize pressures, right? But in this particular case, we are saying that the gases, the gas pressures are being maintained. 
maybe by some mechanism in which you just move it a little faster so that the pressure doesn't really become higher, remains at P2 value. Okay? So, here we are, and therefore, delta U, delta U is equal to, uh, I said, I wrote this as UF minus, UF minus UI is equal to this difference, which is equal to P1 V1 minus P2 V2. Is that is that correct or uh, okay? Uh, this difference, as I said, is equal to this W, and this is equal to minus P two V two, and this is equal to minus P one V one. Why did I write it this way? Okay. Le ye to sign to. Main let me see. Main kahan pe? Yahan pe kahin? Nahi, bilkul thik hai ye. Um. Okay. Uh, thik hai. Main main samajh raha hu ki kahan pe maine. Um, so this is actually uh, uh, sorry yes No, they, 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 that would automatically come out by taking with, with, what, the, what the initial and final values of volume are. So I say that you should add the works there. Over there I should add the works. I should add the works over there. I, um, hold on a second, let me, let me check if that is what we need to do. Uh, this is minus P2V2. And that is minus uh, of that, and that. Okay. No, I need to have actually a sign um, in this manner. This is u2 minus u1. I. Uh, <coughs> So that I have U2 plus P2 V2 is equal to U1 plus P1 V1. I need to have it this way. And therefore, signs will have to be this way. And that, I think, maybe, um, I think because the signs are taken appropriately over here, maybe this is what. Your, your point is right that this will be a sum of the two works and um, this total work will be a sum of these two works and these two works have the signs contained in them and hence this will be a relationship that will have signs like this. The conclusion is that both the sites contain a thermodynamic quantity called enthalpy. So this is when H2 is equal to H1. So what it shows is that in this particular process, enthalpy of the system has not changed on the two sides of the of the of the porous plug. The works, you see, the the, the argument that I'm taking now is that this is. Uh, a, this is not actually an integration. This is basically a work that was being done in the final case plus work that was being done on the other side. And the signs that go with the work will be taken care of by the volumes, by, by looking at how the volume changes, whether it is expansion or it is uh, compression. And, uh, and therefore, I, this is a little 
um, mistaken in the sense that it is not quite integration. It is uh, some of the changes, some of the works that has that some of the total the work that has been performed in part one and in the part two of the uh, chambers of the of the system. Okay. I think this is this is the crucial point over here that in a Jules Thompson experiment, in a Jules Thompson experiment, in the porous plug experiment, enthalpies do not change. And we can make use of that now to evaluate change in temperature when enthalpies do not change. So we say, all right? Now we will say, that, okay, there is a change in pressure which causes a change in temperature under the condition that enthalpies, enthalpy doesn't change. So what I have just written actually describes the um, porous plug experiment or the Joule Thomson effect. And the quantity that I have written over here is called the, uh, usually written as mu H times dP. dT is mu H times dP. The change in um, temperature because of change in pressure is given by this coefficient and this coefficient is called Joule Thomson coefficient. Okay? Now in this Joule Thomson coefficient we can easily work it out. Uh, this this Joule Thomson co coefficient. Joule Thomson coefficient mu is uh, dt by dp at constant h. And like we did for constant u, you can easily um, work this out. And uh, rather than do it here, I will just write down the final expression for it. This comes out to be V over Cp times T alpha P minus 1. And um, hoping that you will check it out. You will check that this is indeed what, how it comes out. And the procedure will be exactly as we did over here. Rather than H, we will have U. And rather than using du equal to TDS minus PDV, we will use dh equal to TDS plus VDP and get all of this expression. Okay? Fine. You can again see that mu equal to zero for, a, for an ideal gas. Because alpha p is equal to 1 over t, as we said. Alpha p is equal to 1 over t. And therefore, for an ideal gas, this will be 0, and mu will be equal to 0. So if you put an ideal gas in a Joule Thomson experiment, there will be no change in temperatures. And if you put a real gas, there will be a reduction in um, temperature. Um, we will, however, rather than work it out for, an, for a non-ideal gas, we will just have a look in the following form. We will say um, that this expression implies that T F minus T I is equal to 
Oops. Oh, this is terrible, terrible, terrible. This is terrible, terrible. Are bhai. Mu H times P F minus P I. Okay. Uh, Jill Thompson coefficient relates initial and final pressures and temperatures. So if um, mu can be this mu can be positive as well as negative. Both positive and negative depending upon whether that T alpha P is greater than 1 or less than 1. There is no specific um, condition that can make that quantity a positive uh, or a negative quantity so that we always see um, a cooling. Uh, that is not the case over here. So uh, mu can be uh, positive, can be negative. If suppose mu is um, positive then um, P F greater than P I implies or P I P I greater than P F implies T I greater than T F. And we know that in this particular case we had said that P1 is greater than P2. So P i is greater than indeed P f and therefore initial temperature is greater than final temperature which means that when the gas has passed through this porous plug and has come down over here it is already cooled. So this leads to cooling of the gas. So cooling will take take place only when mu is positive. And um, when mu is negative, then heating takes place. Uh, except that it is uh, over there, in the case of an adiabatic expansion, it is nearly a free expansion, free adiabatic expansion, not a throttling process. And in this particular expansion, where you have a fixed P1 and P2, completely fixed during the entire process, not changing at all, is the one where P1 doesn't change and P2 doesn't change. Then uh, in that particular process, um, your, 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 your cooling takes place and in, in, in a different situation, okay? So uh, this is, uh, and this is something in which you let it pass through pores so that it sort of is a throttling process. Uh, so this is mu H, Positive is the, is the condition under which cooling takes place. If mu h is negative, then it means um, uh, the gas will be heated up. I would uh, 
we, we can see that in the following form graphically that um, if I take P on this side and T on this side then for mu positive uh, there will be the curve T on P, T on T P curve will be will have a positive slope a mu H positive means a positive slope of the curve between T and P and so the variation will be something like this and this variation will be for values of H1 and H2 and H3 for constant values of H for different constant values of H these would be different this is positive slope positive slope is like this okay and for okay and for uh, mu H negative the slope is negative the curve would be like this for H1 and H2 and H3 okay positive slope and negative slope and therefore in totality we should actually see something like this P and T having some curves of the kind that go like this. Oh. Where they have positive slope as well as negative slopes. On to one side you have therefore a line over here. On to one side you have mu h positive. On the other side you have mu h negative. And this line uh, has some name also inversion curve which is called. This dotted line is called inversion curve. And this is actually um, how you see um, the variation in pressure and temperature as in this particular um, cooling process. Uh, okay, you are you are right in the sense that if you go back to the expression over here in this expression, it all depends upon these quantities. So, for a there there, there would be these um, um, quantities that could. You know, alpha p, if it's a function of temperature, then it could um, be such that this quantity could become positive as well as negative. You see, we are taking alpha p to be a system constant, right? A system characteristic. And normally these are called constants of uh, systems. But these actually are not constant. They depend upon temperature, they depend upon pressure, they depend upon these quantities and therefore heat capacity itself depends upon temperature. And um, uh, this, this quantity, coefficient of expansion, uh, coefficient of thermal expansion is also a temperature dependent quantity. So this is something which can actually have both positive and negative values. Okay? And hence we have uh, this uh, process in which we would like to remain within this region for cooling rather than in this region. Okay. I would then briefly touch upon one aspect which um, in cooling techniques which you had already seen earlier but I will still go through it to tell you how that how it works and this is the um, a 
the refrigeration cycle, in the cooling, cooling techniques. My third point today is the first one was the in the cooling techniques. First one was the Joule free expansion, then joule homson effect, and number three is vapor compression cycle. And the fourth one, fourth example of cooling, fourth and fifth, will be actually most interesting, which can give rise to very, very uh, cold temperatures. This is a, a refrigerator cycle, actually, which is a heat pump in reverse. We have already seen this. And if you schematically, you would recall that you supposed to be a cold, cold reservoir and uh, there is a hot reservoir and what you do is you take heat out of the cold reservoir and do some work on it and throw the heat into the cold reservoir, into a hot reservoir. So this will be QC and QH. This is the this is the cycle. This is the schematic diagram of a of a of what you, what you in fact we initially called a in, in inverse heat engine. You recall that a heat engine takes heat from a hot reservoir and performs work and dumps the remaining heat into the cold reservoir. Um, the refrigerator works in the reverse way. We are sitting over here in a refrigerated environment and the refrigerator is taking heat out of this and throwing it out, which is a hotter part. So it is take and for this it will need to do some work and that work is being done over here. And uh, in a vapor compression cycle you have four steps. Uh, let me actually show these four steps in a uh, picture format also. You have uh, and this is, as I said, a vapor compression cycle. And the active medium, in this case, is a gas with low boiling point. A gas which boils pretty quickly. Uh, this is the active medium. Usually, this is what you use freon gas. I don't know what that is, freon gas, or you have um, CFC gas, which is um, chlorofluorocarbon gas, which is now being, all of these gases are being uh, forbidden nowadays because they go up into the environment and uh, eat up ozone, and because they eat up ozone, uh, we get we receive more of ultraviolet radiation, so these gases are banned now. But this is, this is the example where you take such gases, such liquids, or such gases which have low, liquids which have low uh, boiling points, and they can, um, they can um, vaporize, they can be vaporized at a lower temperature, and they can be uh, condensed also at a lower temperature. And the process goes in the following way. You have a cold reservoir, as in this case. 
and um, from where the uh, heat Q C comes in, as in this case. But here, this um, heat that comes in is used to evaporate the gas. So you have an uh, evaporator over here. It evaporates the gas and then the gas is taken to uh, a compressor. Where it is, and compressor means you actually perform work on it. You take it to a compressor and the gas is compressed and this compressed gas is then brought and let me also tell you um, so this is um, uh, actually we should start from here the gas comes in this is evaporator means the gas now it is in the form of a gas gas comes in and here it is adiabatic compression adiabatic compression means that you have uh, oh, I can do this over here adiabatic compression means that you know when you have a gas and you write P, a PV, make a PV diagram of it and then you have isotherms and adiabats so when you take and you this, this you do already so well if you compress it from VI to VF you actually um, and from pressure P1 to pressure P2 or P, V1 to V2 if you compress it from V1 P1 to V2 P2 that is compression right it actually you go a high up in temperature you increase the temperature this is T1 this is T2 and T2 is larger than T1 we had seen this earlier also so on an adiabat when you travel on an adiabat you increase the temperature so, um, here you actually are doing adiabatic compression and therefore increasing the temperature of the gas. Okay? <clears throat> so the gas that leaves over here has, over here it had um, low P, low pressure, low temperature and um, high volume. But when it comes out over here, it is at higher pressure, high temperature, and low volume. Obvious from here. If it goes from here to here, this is what will happen. It goes from low pressure to high pressure, low temperature to high temperature, high volume to low volume. Okay? This is very obvious. And then it is taken through a condenser. Condenser is the one where you cool it down in some form. And when you cool it down, it actually gives off heat. QH to the high temperature or, or what you call hot reservoir and um, and then you bring it down from there and this after the condenser, condenser it leaves as a liquid 
because it has condensed, it leaves as a liquid at high pressure. And then it is brought back over here and you let it through a throttle This is all happen, happening over here in these air conditioning systems. I'm just describing that, you know. This is, you let it through a throttle, and the throttle will push it, the gas will be pushed through these porous system, through a throttle. It expands and cools. <coughs> so all Jules Thompson um, process is taking place over here and then it is it then is brought back uh, over here and as it is brought back over here it absorbs heat from the cold reservoir and evaporates again and then becomes a gas at low pressure and the cycle is complete uh, this one in the throttle. Yes. No, this will be uh, because it is being pushed up, pushed into. It will be exp there will be a process of expansion. So when liquid is pushed, it expands and becomes gas. Okay. So this will be a gas <laughs> over here. You see, uh, this is how your air conditioning system works. And if you like, I can actually. We can look at it. Oh, we have plenty of time. No? You guys have been doing it. You guys have been sitting for a long time. We can do it. 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 Not only that the air conditioning is not coming, but the air conditioning is not coming. Huh? Good. So, give me a little bit. Give me a little bit. I'm going to finish your cooling system. And after that, the cooling system is actually very exciting. Yes, sir. 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 Let me write down, make this PV phase diagram and tell you what is actually happening over there. You have uh, state one and then state two over here. Uh, this is point one to point two and then point three and then point four somewhere over here and then back to point one. And here, this, is, this should be actually a straight line. This is, uh, this is, you can start by saying that this is point one. Point two, point three, and point four is what is described over here. But one interesting thing, which is can does, can't is not visible over there, is this phase diagram that I am plotting over here. The dotted line, the dashed line, shows different phases of the system. There is the there is gas over here, uh, this is liquid over here, and gas over the side. So we have therefore a, if, and this is the mixed phase, mixed liquid gas phase. You know, there is a, this phase transition from gas to liquid to liquid to gas. So we actually are working in this manner. In the first case, in the case of going from 1 to 2, in this case, we actually are working with a gas. And then in the condenser, this is, this is when we pass from 2 to 3, we go into a condenser. And condenser make turns it into a liquid. So when you arrive at point three, you already are um, the gas is already in a liquid form. 
and then when you go from liquid to uh, from three to four, you're in a mixed liquid gas phase where some of the liquid turns into gas through the throttling process. And then you come back after the evaporator, you come back into the gaseous phase. A very interesting thing, you know, this is, this is where all of this phase, with the, the phases in which the system, the active, uh, active uh, in, uh, medium passes through and um, the various cycles in which it, uh, ways in which it goes through is uh, um, visible over here. Okay. Throttle, Jules Thompson, come. Uh, this is actually forced expansion. You force it through some porous medium and let it expand through a nozzle maybe and let it expand. Okay. And now I will actually come down to discussing the last cooling um, experiment which is very interesting. And we can't see the last cooling technique without understanding the third law of thermodynamics. So third law of thermodynamics, you have been waiting for third law of thermodynamics since day one, okay? So now here comes third law of thermodynamics. Actually, there was, a, there was once when I actually mentioned this third law of thermodynamics. And this was when I was describing the efficiency of a Carnot engine. You would remember the efficiency of this Carnot. Carnot's theorem says that there can't be any engine more efficient than the Carnot engine, right? And uh, the efficiency of this engine, eta, is equal to, this engine runs between two reservoirs, um, a low temperature reservoir and a high temperature reservoir. And these reservoirs are given by the temperatures that they actually have. So, a low temperature and a high temperature. And, uh, at that time I mentioned that you know, there is this third law of thermodynamics peeping through this efficiency, expression for efficiency, because you could turn the efficiency equal to one, which is the highest efficiency, equal to one by taking uh, TL to be the absolute zero of temperature, the lowest of possible, the lowest possible temperature, absolute zero. And because you can't do this, because the uh, Carnot uh, theorem says that this is the most efficient, highest efficiency that you can get, which is, and which cannot be equal to one. There will have to be some um, heat thrown out somewhere, some heat lost somewhere. Therefore, this TL cannot be zero degree Kelvin. So it is already here that TL cannot be uh, zero degree absolute. Now again, this somebody will object to is putting the zero on top over here. But this is in a in a more recent convention. You don't put that degree sign of degree in some older conventions. You used to put this sign. Cannot be zero degree Kelvin. And this is the essence of the description of third law of thermodynamics. Third law of thermodynamics says by no finite number of processes K 
can you achieve zero degree Kelvin? Zero degree Kelvin is unachievable. This is the statement of the law of the universe. I'm sorry? Sorry, the statement is TH. TL and TH both cannot be zero, right? No, 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 but TH can be, is meant to be higher than TL. Yes, okay? Mm -hmm. So TL is, uh, you know, his, his, his comment was that both TL and TH cannot be zero, which is true, but my point is that the lower temperature cannot be as low as zero degree Kelvin. So, <clears throat> TL cannot be zero degree Kelvin. This does, it doesn't read, shouldn't read okay. It cannot be okay. It is not okay. It is zero degree Kelvin. Okay, and um, this is uh, a statement which says that in in no finite number of cooling processes can one achieve um, absolute zero. temperature, which is not possible to achieve, okay? This is the uh, statement of uh, third law of thermodynamics. A different form of this law is that the entropy, uh, there are two other ways in which this law is stated, and this law is not very, not very old. It is was enunciated towards the beginning of the, about a hundred years ago. Um, so entropy is, uh, 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 is uh, of a <coughs> pure crystalline substance uh, is zero at zero, at absolute zero. Yet another way of saying the same thing is that entropy of all the substances approach the same value as T approaches zero. So as temperature approaches zero, Kelvin, uh, entropy of all the substances approach the same value. Yet another way of stating the same law is that uh, uh, ds approaches zero as T approaches zero. Change in entropy. You see, entropy was defined in a manner in which it was not on any absolute scale, but on a, as, uh, in, in, in relation to entropy at some other point. So it was as if, like electrical potential energy that you define or, or, or mechanical potential energy that you actually uh, do not have an absolute scale for it. You define it in relation to some other uh, point, uh, some other potential energy value. This is how this whole thing goes. And now the cooling uh, mechanism, which is uh, what, and also you remember that entropy is a measure of disorder, right? A substance which is more disordered has a higher value of entropy than a substance which is less disordered, correct? Which means that if you look at a substance like a paramagnet,
and you apply magnetic field to it, then that paramagnet becomes ferromagnet when you apply field to it. So it actually goes through two different states. In one state it is uh, completely disordered when it is paramagnetic. In the other case it is completely ordered. There should be a difference in the entropy of these two systems. All right? And hence, you can imagine that if you have entropy on uh, temperature on this side and entropy on this side, then um, in a disordered state, the entropy would be this. In the ordered state, the entropy would be this. Okay? And perhaps the, temper the, the systems are approaching, you know, the difference in entropy is becoming narrow, zero and zero. It is coming here. So this is um, magnetized state. And this is demagnetized state. Demagnetized state means this is a paramagnet, paramagnetic state. And this is when it is in the magnetic field. Now look at this. Suppose we do two things one after the other. Isothermally magnetize and adiabatically demagnetize. Isothermally magnetization means coming from the top curve into, a, into the bottom curve. You go magnetize from demagnetized state to the magnetized state. And isothermally doing it at the same temperature. Vertically coming down from one to the other. And adiabatic demagnetization means you go horizontally. Adiabatic means constant entropy. You go horizontally, demagnetize, therefore you go from magnetized state into the demagnetized state. So if you go uh, adiabatic demagnetization, you will go from here to here. All right? So now, in this particular process, in go doing go, uh, in isothermal magnetization and then adiabatic demagnetization, we have already reduced the temperature this much. All right? And if you continue the process again and again, we will actually reduce the temperature to very, very low values. Okay? So this process is called adiabatic demagnetization. Adiabatic demagnetization is a cooling process by which you can attain very low temperatures. And nuclear, magneti nu nuclear magnetization and nuclear demagnetization can be even faster than this. And therefore, um, nuclear demagnetization, adiabatic nuclear demagnetization is a process by which you can reach extremely low temperatures of the order of um, millionth of a Kelvin or even lower than that, okay? Um, so I, what we discussed today was all about the um, uh, cooling processes and uh, uh, I hope you will receive assignments and problems in relation to that soon. Okay, thank you very much for these extra 15 minutes.